Hey everybody, welcome to Democratic Theory. Uh, this is the introductory lecture for the course and I'm going to just jump right in. As you can see, I have an entire board full of notes. That's the method I'm gonna use for a lot of the lectures for this class. Um, the uh, picture of the board will also be available as a JPEG after this, so you don't have to worry about trying to write it all down. It's gonna be available for you. Um, I'm gonna jump right in and talk about what this lecture is, what democratic theory is and hopes to do. And this lecture, I'm gonna to try to give an overview of what it is that democratic theory as an endeavor is, and then also what we as a class for the next 10 weeks are going to do in terms of exploring this uh, topic and this practice of democratic theory. Because that's what democratic theory is. It's a practice, it's, 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 a, it's a thing that's done by democratic theorists who are essentially exploring the nature of democracy uh, at the highest, most abstract levels of uh, sort of what is democracy down to the most pragmatic level of what is it that can manifest a democracy. And so what we'll be doing in this class is a combination of those two things, of the philosophizing and of uh, the pragmatics. Um, so I'm just going to go through the notes uh, that I have on the board here and talk about the stuff as I go along. That's going to be the method that I use. So I'm just going to jump right in. Um, first, to start with a definition, because one of the things about democratic theory is one of the open questions is what is a democracy? What does democracy mean, right? We can do an etymology on the word, and demos comes from the Greek for people, and necrasi means to rule, the people to rule. Um, that's the etymology of it, but there's also been, throughout the history of this word and of analysis of democracy, the open question of, well, what really is a democracy? What does it mean for there to be a, a democracy uh, or democratic system? I'm defining it as the people governing themselves. And that is a you know, more specific definition than just saying democracy, which is a word that carries a lot of meanings and a lot of connotations with it, um, yet it still leaves a lot of unanswered questions. And in fact, it raises a lot of questions. Um, the big question it raises is, what does it mean for people to govern itself? If we're gonna define democracy as the people governing themselves, well, what does it mean to govern themselves? Uh, this is a really difficult question that is essentially the core question of democratic theory, that th this practice of exploring ideas and uh, pragmatics and institutions, behaviors, all the stuff that we're going to do in this class and that I'm going to lay out uh, in this lecture is geared towards trying to create a world in which the people govern themselves. But what does that mean, right? That's actually that big question is always going to be the background guiding question of our exploration of this. And everybody who does democratic theory, whatever aspect they're doing of it, um, whether they're talking about uh, um, balloting methods or talking about uh, deliberation or talking about civic virtue, they're always referencing back to this question, what does it mean for people to govern itself? Uh, that is hard to answer. Now, here are some essential questions that are related to that that get us a little more fine-grained uh, into uh, our investigation of this big question. What's required and forbidden, right? There are bound to be, for the people to govern itself, there are bound to be certain things that are necessary conditions. Uh, that if you don't have them, then you don't have a democratic system. And then there are other things that if they're present, it means it's anti-democratic or undemocratic, non-democratic. Um, whatever term you want to use. And there is a difference between anti-democratic, which is something that works against democracy, and non-democratic, which is something that essentially neutrally just doesn't further uh, democracy. But um, what can't be there? Like what aspects can we not have if we're going to call our system a democratic system, if we're going to say that the people are governing themselves? Um, Really big question, and this is a lot of what we're gonna do for two thirds of this class particularly, but it's always gonna be there for the whole, the whole class. What options are available? Um, the thing that's tough about a democratic system is that there's not just one way of the people ruling themselves. There are lots of different options, and the history of democratic theory actually is partly, uh, and especially for the, for the, throughout the 19th century, was an exploration of what are the different options available. Uh, if we know we're going to have voting, great, okay, so, but what are the different ways to vote? What are the different kinds of things to vote for? What are the different ways to count those votes? What are the different ways to lead up to the process of people voting? Are they going to be uh, a secret ballot or are they going to be public? What are the options? And 
by talking about the options, we're also going to then be talking about the exclusions, which is kind of like the for things that are forbidden. Um, what cannot be part of a democratic society that's off the table? Uh, the list of options is, as we'll see, particularly in uh, the module one of this class, but also into module two, the list of options is actually quite large, and it's almost always larger than people in a particular democratic society uh, think. Because when you live in a democratic society, like in the United States, we live in the world's oldest continually operating de democracy, we're so familiar with certain features of our democratic system that uh, we think that that's the, essentially the range of options that are available. Um, and many people don't realize that, oh, there are, there are things that other democratic societies do that we don't do that are legitimate options for uh, a self-governing system. So when we look at democratic theory from the sort of highest point, looking down at all the different uh, ways that people can govern themselves, we have to realize what are all the options. Also knowing that when you manifest a, a democratic system, when you create one, when you write a constitution, when you set up institutions, when uh, you begin uh, um, operating these governing institutions, that you're going to exclude some of those options. And that doesn't mean that they aren't legitimate democratic options just because you exclude them. You just can't do everything, right? When you have a menu, unless you're really, really hungry, you're not going to eat everything that's on the menu uh, unless the menu has two things and you eat both of those things. A democratic uh, system has a big menu, and we're, our question is, what's on there? What options are available? Um, just as important, and because there are so many options, another important question, essential question, is what criteria should be used to judge if a system and a society is democratic? How do we know? How do we tell? Right? And if it is democratic, we say, okay, it hits these marks. Here are the criteria, and it fulfills those criteria. Then we also want to be able to evaluate the relative health of that democratic society or democratic system. Is it, it's a, dem it's a democracy on paper, but is it a vital, living, healthy one? Or it's not even a democracy on paper. So the essential questions we have to get, get to essentially create, as we answer these, create finer grained, more certain boundaries. And a big part of what democratic theory is about is elaborating these boundaries, drawing them, and explaining why it is that they reference back to the people governing themselves. Um, if there are things like, say, uh, hereditary uh, power, positions of power that we say are forbidden, right? Uh, well, we want a criteria to talk about why it is that that doesn't belong on the list of available options. Um, and then also that would relate to something like, you know, let's say that we set up a system where there's not hereditary uh, uh, passing down of, of power or offices, but there is the actual practice and existence of people continuously holding these positions and then their children easily taking those positions, not through heredity, but through the democratic system. Is that... Be a healthy democracy, yes or no, right? So th this is just one example of the many types of questions that we're going to be able to ask. The big question always is though, what does it mean for a people to govern themselves? If that were a simple question with a relatively straightforward singular answer, democratic theory wouldn't be a subject matter. It wouldn't be worthy of books. It wouldn't be worthy of a 10 week class. The fact is that that question, what does it mean for people to govern itself? Is, uh, has many different possible answers. It's a much more complex question than it seems upon first glance, and these are some of the sub-questions that need to get asked. So, in this class, always in the back of your mind, whatever aspect of uh, democratic theory we're looking at, whatever specific details or questions or procedures we're examining, always have in the back of your head that the, the reference point has to be the people governing itself but that that reference point is slippery and controversial and uh, there may not be a singular answer, a satisfying answer to this. That's one of the things that in my experience of teaching uh, politics in general and political philosophy and democratic theory is that a lot of people want there to be an answer. Like, well, what's the answer? What is it? What are the criteria? What is required and forbidden? Um, I wish I could give you that answer. What democratic theory really is, is an exploration of the different possible ways to answer that. And from the point of view of our class, an exploration of the different positions, arguments for those positions, arguments against those positions, reasons why you would want to sort of plant your flag in one place versus another. Now, that's sort of at the 
philosophical level of the big questions. What are we doing? What's the exploration? What are the contours of the exploration? That's what it is. I'm going to move over to the other side here of the board because there are really two big areas that we're going to go to in democratic theory. And the course is organized around these two big areas. And they are what I call pragmatics and values. And there's a, something, it's a little arbitrary calling it those things, but I just like to have a category title so that we can kind of say, okay, here are the two big buckets of questions and explorations and issues that we're going to look at. Uh, the uh, pragmatics are about setting up a democratic system, and the values are about establishing a democratic society. And um, there's a certain artificiality to this distinction between a democratic system and a democratic society, because you're never really going to have one without the other. They come paired together. If you, if you set up a democratic system, um, if you address the pragmatics and write a constitution and create a self-governing uh, system, then or a system where the people govern themselves, you're going to be creating a democratic society by default, right? Um, and if you have a democratic society where people actually have the expectation that they will get to govern themselves and that the, the type of uh, institutions and practices and procedures that are followed add up to the people governing themselves, then you have to have a democratic system. The reason I divide them into two, though, is because there, I think, are different, uh, they have a different nature. They have different personality types. A democratic system really is a collection of a certain set of pragmatic things. Um, it's not totally reducible to the writing of a democratic constitution, um, but the democratic constitution is the foundational piece of this pragmatics. Um, there are other things that get done. Most democracies don't have a constitution that lays out the answers to all of the pragmatics. Um, most constitutions set up procedures for enabling some of those pragmatics to be, to be answered down the line. For example, in the U.S. Constitution, um, the uh, design of the executive branch is left up to the legislative branch with the exception of the office of president and vice president and then the specific powers attached to uh, to those uh, offices. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of setting up government institutions in the U.S. Constitution that's left not to the Constitution itself, but to the statutory process, the process of making laws. This is relatively common, though what is also true is that most constitutions, U.S. state constitutions as well as world democratic constitutions, do a lot more to answer the pragmatic questions than the U.S. Constitution does. Our Constitution is extraordinarily short. It's less than 5,000 words. It leaves a lot up to the uh, subsequent process. Uh, many constitutional conventions come up with far more of the pragmatic answers at the foundational level than the U.S. Constitution did. Um, and so there's actually a range of ways to address these pragmatics, either at the start, and we have a very vibrant, robust, large rule book, or we have a relatively small set of uh, rules, and then the rule book itself is, is written as the rules are being played out. That can happen. But those questions have to be answered. What are the offices, right? Um, what are the institutions that these offices are embedded in? Uh, what are the selection methods for filling those offices, right? And I say selection methods rather than voting because one of the things I think that uh, is a real confusion or a, I would say a, a misconception about democracy is that democracy is majority rule, democracy is voting. Democracy or voting and majority rule are both uh, components. They're definitely options that are available for running a democratic society. But there are many different ways that uh, de decisions can be made in a democratic system. For filling offices, sometimes it's voting, sometimes it's appointment, sometimes it's a different uh, style of assessment, like a, if you have a, 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 a professional uh, civil service, a bureaucracy, the way you get those offices is not by being appointed or by being elected, it's by being hired. And appointment and hiring are two different things. So selection methods are uh, much more diverse than we m normally think. It's not just election. Um, and offices are not all elected offices. Office is any uh, uh, position within the government institution that has power, responsibility, uh, um, discretion. That is, of course, another as aspect of the pragmatics is what are the powers, responsibilities, and limits uh, of these institutions and of these offices and of the selection mechanism and the people who are running the selection mechanisms. Um, and then finally, what are the interactions and processes?
How do the different offices and the different institutions interact with each other? How do they limit each other? How do they share or divide responsibility? How is power parsed out? Uh, and what processes lead from action to outcome? Uh, the idea of a democratic system is that the people govern themselves. And governing means making rules, distributing resources, taking action, enforcing, evaluating, judging. There's all kinds of things that are involved in governing yourself. Uh, one of the pragmatics, or not one of the, one of the areas of pragmatics, is what are the processes that uh, are involved in that? Um, when somebody is accused of breaking the law, what are the processes that uh, would be utilized to be able to say that is a democratic process for deciding whether this person is guilty or innocent? So these questions are, there's, there, these are just basically the big categories of questions. Within each of these categories, there are, I won't say innumerable because that implies infinite, but there are, there are many, many different specific questions, right? Like government institutions. This is not just the three branches of government, right? The legislative, executive, and judicial. And in fact, one of the things that we'll look at in this class is thinking beyond the three branch uh, model. Uh, that was a very early and we could say crude version of what a set of government institutions uh, is and it's not the only way uh, to organize. There could be more than three for sure um, and of course the interaction between those three, the way those powers are divided up and the responsibilities are either shared or exclusively held, there's, it is subject to multiple different ways of doing it. Um, what are the offices? I mean, there are, you know, this is one of the things that, uh, what does a government actually look like? What are the places that people go? Uh, there are, of course, there are judges and there are police officers and there are legislators. What else? Like, what are all of the offices? And most of these different containers have, while we have specific questions to answer within them, they also are related to each other. So for example, offices and institutions. Which offices are in which institutions? Right? And it, would, it seems obvious a lot of times that like, okay, the U.S. Marshal would be in the executive branch because what they're doing is they're enforcing the law. But there might be a good reason to put a marshal-like force inside of the legislative branch or the judicial branch so that the heads of those different branches have uh, controlled, direct discretionary control over this particular set of office holders. Uh, so there, whilst a lot of these offices, where they go in which institution might seem obvious, that's mostly just because we're used to the organization that we have currently. The same thing is true for selection methods in offices. What method is best used to select the people who fill these offices? We're very familiar in the United States, at the federal level at least, with appointed judges and justices. Um, that's one selection method. Uh, there are other selection methods course, election and different kinds of election. There's also hiring, right? There's, there's no reason why the appointment of judges makes more sense than other, uh, than other methods of selecting those office holders. Uh, now, again, because I want to go back to the what are the options available, one of the things to note always is that there's not one answer, right? Okay, so let's say we have trial court judges is one of our offices, and the institution we put that in is the ju judicial branch organized hierarchically like the one we have uh, is. If those judges are hired through a kind of a professional civil service process, that could be democratic, or it could be conducted in a way that's not democratic. That could be uh, meritocratic, it could be some other uh, cratic. Um, what if, what, if, what if judges are elected? Is that necessarily more democratic than some kind of hiring? What if they're appointed? Um, there's no real answer like, well, okay, elected is the most democratic, appointed is the second most democratic, and hired is the third most democratic. It really does depend on, one, how that selection mechanism is set up to, uh, um, to function in reality, and two, how does that uh, selection method relate to the other pieces of the pragmatic system that we're putting together. Almost nothing can be judged in isolation, right? It might make a lot of sense when you look at what a particular office does, like trial court judges for, let's say, family uh, court issues, child custody, divorce, domestic disputes, uh, property distribution. Um, it might make a lot of sense given where that office is located in the larger system of government, to have those trial judges be hired through some kind of professional civil service process. Um, 
Or, depending on, again, how the whole system is set up, it might make more sense to have those people elected rather than hired. Um, but it could also be that the way we have our entire system organized, in, in context, that it would be uh, problematic, it would be less democratic to have those judges be elected than to be either appointed or hired. And so all of the evaluations of different choices and different options have to be done in context. So that's another thing to keep in mind when doing democratic theory. You can't decontextualize the uh, questions. You can't decontextualize the choices that are made. If we say we're going to have elected judges, that sounds the most democratic because we're used to the idea of elections voting being a democratic process. But if you elect judges who have a particular kind of power and role in the whole system, you might end up with judges who are doing that job differently than you want them to do, right? Because uh, people who are elected are thinking about voters. People who are hired are thinking about meeting the, the professional criteria they have to meet. People who are appointed are thinking about those who are appointing them. So uh, the attitudes and dispositions that come with different pragmatic choices can't be separated from the broader context of what that office is, what institution it's, it's located in, what the powers and responsibilities are, what the interactions and processes are. Um, if a trial judge is making a final determination that's not subject to appeal, that might mean that one selection method is better than another. If that trial judge's decisions can be uh, appealed and overridden by a, by a higher court through a certain kind of process, that might mean that a different selection mechanism is good. That if uh, judges are making a final determination that's unappealable, then we might want them to be elected so that they actually are thinking about the people. But if a judge is making essentially a professional determination of the rules that is appealable to a higher court, it might make a lot of sense to have that judge be hired or appointed, right? And hiring and appointing are different from each other, though they, they're, they're more similar to each other than uh, election is. So all of these questions, that we will, and we will look at the diversity of uh, questions that get asked as well as the diversity of answers. That's gonna be a big part of what module one is about um, and also uh, a decent chunk of what module two is about. Um, but these questions all have to get answered so that we can design a democratic system, a system that has rules, roles, institutions, offices, practices, actions, and outcomes. Uh, and that's what a democratic system is. It's a system, it's like a machine that's built to produce outcomes. And those outcomes are decisions and actions by the government, what generally goes under the blanket term of policy. Policy outcomes are what a democratic system gives us. Actually, any system of government, whether democratic or not, gives us policy outcomes. Um, we want to make sure in a democratic system that those policy outcomes represent the people governing themselves. Now, the other piece of it is that you could have a democratic system. You could have all of these rules, roles, practices, procedures in place that fit our definition of what a democracy is. But if you don't have a democratic society where people have certain attitudes and attributes and uh, value certain things, then the democracy itself will be an empty exercise in procedure. It could be formally a democracy, but it doesn't live like a democracy. Uh, and that's because uh, a democratic society is not just one that has certain processes that are followed. It's one where there are certain attitudes and values that are upheld, that are lived out, that are manifested in the specific pragmatics of our democratic action. And there are a bunch of different questions we have to ask, right? What values, traits, decisions are important and essential for a democracy, right? Do we need people to, one, believe in a common good or not? Do we need, two people to believe in self-reliance? Do we need people to believe in the rule of law? Do we need people to believe in uh, virtuous behavior? There are all kinds of potential values and traits and dispositions and expectations that we might think are essential for the people living in a democratic society to have so that the democratic system itself isn't just this empty formal shell of a machine that runs according to these procedures, but that actually adds up to not the people governing themselves just formally, but the people actually really, in spirit, actually governing themselves. Um, how can those values and traits, etc., be created and sustained? This is actually a tricky question, and not every early democratic theorist uh, paid attention to this question. Um, in fact, some of them, and James Madison was one of the primary ones, didn't want to think about creating attitudes, values, traits, or dispositions. He just wanted to take, uh, and a lot of the early thinkers wanted to just take human nature as given, 
and then organize the democratic system around the limits and opportunities of human nature. Other democratic theorists since then, and even some at the time, and John Adams was one of them, believed that there was a need to generate certain kinds of behaviors, attitudes, values. Uh, one of the biggest containers for concepts was civic virtue, that a democratic society doesn't exist without civic virtue. And civic virtue is not built into us, it is cultivated, it's implanted, it's nourished, it's cultivated. So we have to ask the question, how can the traits that we, that we uh, deem essential be created and sustained? If a sense of a common good or a public good or a, uh, a sort of social uh, good is one of the things we think is essential for the people governing themselves, how do we get people to have a sense of operating towards the common good and of, and of orienting their individual decisions around the requirements of, uh, of society? What happens to the system when the society falls short, right? This is where we start to pay attention to when we have formally a democratic system, but our democratic society doesn't align, it doesn't fully live up to it. It's not healthy, it doesn't actually uh, sustain and create these values. And then the final question is, how can a democracy heal itself, right? If, if, if the democratic society is drifting away from these important values and dispositions, what can be done within the democratic system itself to promote healing. One of the things about a democracy is that it is actually, because it doesn't reference itself to, out, to any outside force, there's no higher power, right? It's not the people governing themselves as overseen by the wise lawgiver, or as overseen by God, or as overseen by a set of angels. It has to be self-referential, and therefore it needs to be self-healing in order to be able to function. A failing democracy can't turn to some outside force. It can't turn to an aristocratic base to heal it. That would be undemocratic. That would actually be anti-democratic. So a democracy actually has to hold itself up. It has to be self-referential and self-healing. And that is, of course, a very tricky thing to, to, to create a system and a society that can manifest these values as well as heal them when uh, there's some drifting away from it. So that is the terrain right there. All of this stuff is the terrain of democratic theory. This is what democratic theory is trying to do. And the hope that the title of this is what democratic theory is, that's what it is. It's all these questions and all of these things from the pragmatics, the most specific pragmatics of like, what are the offices, down to the big value questions of how can the democracy heal itself. And what it hopes to do is to be able to address all of these questions with enough certainty, detail, and, and, and uh, argument to be able to then say, okay, here is what we can do to create a democratic society that has a democratic system embedded inside of it. That is the hope of democratic theory, is to provide essentially a map of what a democracy should look like, could look like, will look like, so that when you either look at an actual society or when you're trying to build one, or more realistically, when you're looking at an actual society and trying to reform it to make it more democratic, more sustainable, um, that the map actually provides a really useful orientation tool. So democratic theory hopes to create a useful map of concepts, procedures, values, interactions, criteria, principles to be able to design, maintain and correct a democratic system that's embedded within the broader democratic society.